Good afternoon, everybody. I have the pleasure to welcome today our guest expert for this chapter, Prof Professor Paola Gaeta. Paola is currently professor at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva and is one of the co-editor of the new commentary to the Geneva Conventions that has recently been published by Oxford University Press. Professor Gaeta, we are very happy to have you on board in this course. I would like to ask you three very general questions relating to the mechanism designed to ensure compliance with international humanitarian law. Are you ready to start with the, the first question? Yes, indeed, I'm ready. So I will ask you uh, the, the first question. Could you briefly explain the main influences that the development of international criminal law instruments and case law have had on the interpretation and application of international humanitarian law. In that regard, could you say a few words about the process of individualization of the rules of international humanitarian law through the broadening of the scope of application of the rules of international criminal law in the notion of war crimes? Could you also briefly explain the challenges that this process raises? Uh, well, the impact that international criminal law has had on the interpretation and application of the rules of international humanitarian law has been done through the interpretation of the law of war crimes. Since war crimes are serious violations of the rules of international humanitarian law, which are uh, criminalized under international law, necessarily the judges who had to apply the notion of war crimes had also to pronounce upon some basic rules of international humanitarian law. For instance, uh, by deciding war crimes uh, consisting in attacking the civilian populations, they had also to pronounce upon the notion of an attack, the notion of proportionality in attack, the notion of precautions in attack, and so on and so forth. So the impact uh, has been enormous and has been mainly done by the activity of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which have been uh, the first two international criminal tribunals uh, which have had the opportunity to pronounce uh, on uh, issues of accountability for war crimes. When it comes uh, to the second part of your questions, uh, namely to what extent uh, this has led uh, to broadening uh, the scope of applications of certain rules on war crimes, uh, one has to recall the very important decision of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, eh, for, for, for the former Yugoslavia, concerning the Tadic case. In such a case, the tribunal has taken an interpretation whereby war crimes can also be committed in the context of a non-international armed conflict. And therefore, although the Geneva Conventions do not provide for the criminalization of common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, the tribunal found that this criminalization had occurred in customary international law. This was a landmark decision since until that time it was the traditional wisdom that war crimes could only be committed in the context of an international armed conflict. This has been the first towards what I've called the individualization of the rules of international humanitarian law. Through the law of war crimes, many rules of international humanitarian law that were not, strictly speaking, criminalized under the Geneva Conventions have become the basis for war crimes through the process of interpretation of customary international law. Since uh, this has been also the case of rape, which is not listed uh, as a grave breach in the Geneva Conventions, uh, namely it is not mentioned as a specifically war crime uh, consisting in a grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, but the tribunals have also said that rape 
are war crimes, uh, although not directly included in the grave breach provisions. The system of international criminal justice is today confronted to several important challenges. The first challenge relates to the question of its efficiency and credibility. One of the main criticisms following the conclusion of the ICC trial of Lubanga in 2012 was that after 10 years of existence, the ICC had spent nearly 1 billion euros and produced only one first instance verdict. Moreover, international criminal justice system is confronted to the delicate issue of its legitimacy. The ICC prosecutor continues to face criticism over selection of situations and cases. Many states have expressed their concern that the ICC is only investigating and prosecuting African cases. Many states feel dispossessed of their sovereign power by a system of justice controlled by Western countries. What do you think about this crisis? What should be done in order to face those challenges? Do you think that the establishment of so-called hybrid tribunals, close to where mass crimes are committed, could partly solve these difficulties? Well, first of all, I think that one has to clarify from the outset that the system of international criminal justice uh, is composed by the International Criminal Court at first place, but also by national criminal jurisdictions. So, so we have to see the system in its entirety. And the Rome Statute establishing the International Criminal Court makes it this very clear because the International Criminal Court is a complementary court with respect to the national jurisdiction and will step in only when national courts are unable or unwilling to start investigation or to prosecute cases. At the time when the Rome Statute was adopted, therefore, it was said that the International Criminal Court would have functioned well without cases because the idea was to push states uh, to exercise their duties to prosecute international crimes. Uh, unfortunately, the establishment of the International Criminal Court does not seem, at least doesn't seem so far, to have really reached this goal. Uh, the culture in, of impunity is not necessarily over, is not, necessary, uh, is not necessarily a success, because at the national level uh, I don't see crimes, uh, international crimes, uh, prosecuted at the national level as it should be. At the same time, one has to consider that perhaps uh, the International Criminal Court, as you have mentioned, is facing criticism because of the selection of cases and the selection of situations. Uh, when it comes uh, to the so-called African bias, it is true, however, that uh, the African states have been themselves uh, triggered the jurisdiction of the court, but the prosecutor so far has not really exercised its proper motu powers uh, to start investigations uh, and start prosecution of cases outside uh, the African context. Therefore, partially I would say the criticism that has been raised I tend to share it, although things are little by little changing. I think that one would expect from the International Criminal Court to be truly a universal court, which does not necessarily mean only that the Rome Statute should achieve universal ratification, but that the International Criminal Court manages to show that it's able and willing itself to prosecute also cases concerning Western countries. I think this would be an incredible achievement for the universality of an international criminal court. When it comes to the establishment of mixed and hybrid tribunals, as we know, these tribunals have been established with the cooperation of the UN uh, by the state concerns themselves. Uh, and this is perhaps uh, an interesting way for developing uh, the prosecution of international crimes. Uh, however, I do believe that this sort of mechanism should remain exceptional because it would be much more preferable if domestic, can domestic courts uh, are trained to prosecute international crimes uh, in an ordinary situation with their routine system 
instead of resorting uh, any all the time uh, to ad hoc tribunals uh, that are established uh, because of the lack of capacity at the national level to prosecute international crimes. I think that a serious effort should be done uh, in that respect. Thanks a lot. This is um, uh, very clear. I, I will go to the next question. The Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocol 1 contain provisions concerning the prosecution and punishment of individuals who violate international humanitarian law. States have an obligation to search for, bring before their own court or surrender to another contracting party those allegedly responsible for a grave breach. This obligation, which was revolutionary in 1949 when inserted in the Geneva Conventions, reflect a compromise between different interests and raise several challenges. Could you briefly explain the main goals and challenges of this provision? The provisions of grave breaches are those provisions that, as you said, are imposing upon any contracting state the obligation to search for persons responsible for a grave breach and to bring such persons before their court or to hand them over to another contracting state. This is a very broad obligation upon state parties uh, which is considered to establish mandatory universal jurisdiction, namely every state including the state which has not a link with the crime committed, uh, if, it if it finds a person on its territory should uh, uh, search for such a person and uh, prosecute uh, this person. However, uh, the system of grave breach uh, of gay breaches has not really been a success um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, because uh, ten, in, in, first of all, one has to consider that uh, the prosecution of war crimes uh, often uh, is something that states uh, would prefer not to pursue when they do not have a link with the offence, uh, because uh, they tend not to let's say, put their nose uh, on uh, the issues involving other states. War crimes are usually committed by members of the military uh, under orders of superiors uh, and political leaders are often also implicated. Therefore, for a state which has no link with the crime, uh, it is not really a matter to pursue the fact of prosecuting crimes uh, committed elsewhere under the principle of universal jurisdiction. When it comes uh, to the states which are mostly concerned, uh, namely the belligerent states, uh, uh, usually when they reach a treaty of peace, uh, they tend also to forget about uh, war crimes uh, because in order to reach peaceful relations again, uh, they prefer not to prosecute war crimes committed uh, during the war. So the, uh, usually the system of grave breaches so far has been implemented uh, against what uh, we could call the low cost defendants, uh, namely people either because uh, they were already uh, under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and therefore there was uh, the or implication of the international community and the Security Council to prosecute such uh, war crimes and therefore many defendants uh, who have been prosecuted for grave breaches at the national level are coming from the Yugoslav conflict uh, or it concerns prosecution of uh, persons who have committed war crimes uh, during the Second World War II. So the situation has not really been a success for the system of grave breaches. Perfect, thanks a lot. Now I'll ask you a more personal question. Uh, Paola, you worked for many years in close collaboration with the late professor and judge Cassese. After a long career at the University of Florence, he became in 1993 the first president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He subsequently led the International Commission of Inquiry on Darfur. In 2008, Professor Cassese was appointed president of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. His contribution to the development of international criminal law and international criminal justice has been enormous. Could you please describe in a few words, if possible, his major achievements in this field? 
Well, thank you for asking this question. Of course, for me, it's a great pleasure to mention the work and success of Antonio Cassese in developing international criminal law. As you mentioned, as the first president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, his contribution has been enormous, not only for the institutional building part of the job, but because uh, since he was also an academic and, and he, he had also the pleasure to teach to young people, uh, he has built a community of uh, juniors and scholars uh, in order for them to specialize in international criminal law. So I think the first uh, thing that I would like to mention is the fact that, that by, for instance, creating the international journal, the Journal for International Criminal Justice, uh, which is a journal published by Oxford University Press, by preparing commentaries to the Rome Statute, uh, uh, by pushing uh, young students and scholars to, to write their PhD and so on and so forth, he has built a, an academic community uh, around this new um, branch of law which was developing, namely international criminal law. But then as a judge he has given also an in incredible contribution in the jurisprudence of the case law of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And I think uh, the best contribution or the most important contribution he has given is to say that uh, it exists something such as customer international law in the matter of international crimes. Uh, therefore, through this contribution, he has managed uh, to severe the l links between uh, the statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the activity of the tribunal and has relied upon uh, a very fundamental source of international law, namely customary international law, which has therefore managed to generalize, uh, to make more general, I would say, the case law of the tribunals. In order for uh, a, a group of pupils and friends of Cassese to, to try to continue his legacy, we have established uh, a few years ago a foundation, uh, the Foundation Antonio Cassese for Justice, Peace and Humanity, which tries to promote his legacy by organizing trainings uh, uh, in countries where it is needed, in particular in Africa, in order to train the judges and the prosecutors to prosecute international crimes.